Hey folks, so we'll be doing a little bit of uh, USB device reverse engineering today. Just for fun, uh, I found this uh, USB Hulk smash button and uh, got no drivers for it. I would like to use it uh, in my Linux boxes to trigger various actions and uh, we're going to try to get this working. Uh, so first things first, um, this thing does not register itself as a keyboard or anything like that, unfortunately. Um, the USB HID driver, human interface device driver in Linux, tries to attach to this device, but does not provide any useful output. So I think what we're going to have to do is fire up a Windows VM, install the driver for this, and then sniff and see what the uh, official drivers for this thing actually do to talk to the device. So, uh, time to uh, go through the internet with a fine tooth comb to see if we can find any drivers for this because the uh, company that makes this, uh, it's called Dream Cheeky, uh, does not have any drivers listed for this thing. As a matter of fact, the entire product page is gone. They no longer seem to be hosting it. So uh, we'll see how I do. Um, we'll check back with me later. Oh, and in case you're wondering how it's built inside, that's it. There's a crystal there, one capacitor, and on the underside there's just a little uh, epoxy covered chip on board. So nothing special there. And then the contact, see that little switch there? That's all there is to it. Well, some random Googling has yielded this very interesting site. This is an Amazon S3 listing, apparently uh, for files.dreamcheeky.com, that domain no longer exists, uh, files.dreamcheeky.com that is, but there's some very interesting URLs here. I think we might be able to find something in this list. Hmm. Well, I found this, searching for Hulk in this file. This looks like it might be the manual. So I think if we go up here and paste in... Yep. And I bet if we take this one, which is the next entry, we'll get the drivers. I'm going to save that and uh, try it out in a VM. 27 megabytes? Jeez. You could fly to the moon on 27 megabytes. Well, the software is uh, kind of lame, but it seems to work, so I'm going to push the button. And it just kind of shows the Hulk's stats. That's, that's cool. Um, Let's try interaction, whatever that means. Smash! More smash. Hmm. Alright. Let's try comics. Oh, it's trying to play a video. Alright. Oh, that's Really? Huh. Okay. Okay, so I've fired up Wireshark here. And uh, I don't know which USB interface I need to be listening on, so I just selected both of them. Uh, so, let's hit the go button. I think I haven't set things up right. Okay, I was just missing the USB mon module. Ignore my locale warnings. Okay, so this is interesting. I'm trying to figure out which USB interface to listen on. And uh, the top one is pretty clearly connected to my mouse. So as I move my mouse around, I'm getting peaks there. But USB Mon 2 appears to be relatively flat. So if I go over here and I launch 
the uh, stupid little uh, application there. There we go. USB smash button. I launch that up. That starts up. Let's look over here. The number of requests or packets on this interface goes up. If I then go over here and exit, goes down. So I'm pretty confident that uh, this interface here is the interface I uh, I want to look at. And this is good because I won't have to worry about uh, all of the mouse input messing up my USB capture. One thing that's kind of worrisome here is that uh, if you have this thing plugged into a laptop, uh, this is going to be generating quite a bit of interrupts. Um, so it'll drain your battery a little bit faster, but anyways. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a capture over here. So nothing much has happened. And I want to get the initialization sequence. So I'm going to launch this over here and then we'll watch. There we go. And then I'm going to quit. Maybe we'll be able to see something, make some sense out of this. Okay, so I'm filtering on uh, USB interrupt transfers, which is uh, what this thing appears to use to transfer the information. And uh, if we look at the data here, you can see that it's 1B, a bunch of zeros, and then a 3. If I hit the button, I'm going to push it now, you can see that it becomes 1A temporarily. See that? So I think that's the information that we need to start uh, hacking on this thing a little bit. So we're here at uh, usbmadesimple.co.uk uh, to go over a little bit of how USB works. Now this is new to me as well, so uh, apologies for any bad explanations. But basically, USB behaves similarly uh, to, say, TCP IP in that it's kind of message-based. Uh, so if you, know, you plug in your USB device, say it's a mouse, and uh, you move the mouse, the messages between the computer and the mouse are comprised of well-defined uh, bits of information that have a start and an end and a particular format. Now, uh, USB has multiple data flow types, uh, which you can see here. There's a control transfer, bulk transfer, interrupt transfer, and isochronous transfer, if that's how you say that. And they have different characteristics and bandwidths and error checking uh, capabilities. And uh, you're welcome to go and read this uh, ebook, which is actually pretty good. Um, the thing we care about here is the interrupt transfer. Uh, as you can see, that is uh, what seems to be providing the button data. And if we scroll down here to the interrupt transfers, uh, we can clear up some. Uh, points that have been confusing me. So interrupt transfer is actually a bit of a misnomer. So I quote here, interrupt transfers have nothing to do with interrupts. The name is chosen because they are used for the sort of purpose where an interrupt would have been used in earlier connection types. Um, uh, I won't pass judgment on the USB folks, uh, but it's kind of weird. So an interrupt transfer is not at all an interrupt. Um, you use these from the host to pull for status changes. Um, so, as you can kind of see here, there's much repetition of the same kind of packet, and the button usually responds with the same exact state, but sometimes, you know, when you push the button down, you get a different state, which I've lost, but somewhere in here is a different state. Uh, so we're going to try to duplicate this sort of transfer in a little script so that, uh, well, we can Usurp this button for nefarious purposes. Okay, so armed with this knowledge, we can look at this uh, USB capture a little bit more closely and try to make some more sense of it. So we're looking here at the very end of the capture uh, when I shut down the program. And uh, you might notice a pattern. We've got these two control sequences here, or control packets, followed by these two interrupt packets. Um, and if you scroll up, you can see that that pattern is repeated 
all over the place. And this is the value that I observed change, or I observed to change uh, when I hit the button, this interrupt response here. So looking at this last repetition of the cycle, uh, we can kind of get an idea of uh, cause and effect. So it looks like this control sequence here is actually causing or must come before um, this interrupt transfer here. So maybe we can duplicate that um, as part of a script to kind of automate and uh, communicate with the button. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, well you can, so I've made this little script here. That's the URL. You can find it. Uh, that does exactly that. Um, so if we look at the implementation real quick, I won't bore you, but there's a bunch of command line arguments here, but the meat is down here. What it's going to try to do here is going to try to find a particular device that corresponds to the vendor ID and the product ID um, of this button. Each USB device has a unique combination of uh, vendor ID and product ID. Uh, if it finds the button, it's going to try to basically open it, check some permissions, blah de blah But the interesting part is this. So this buffer here and these constants, uh, like BM request type and uh, W index and all that stuff, is directly lifted from the details of this control sequence. So if we look here, scroll down, we can see that BM request type is 21, B request is 9, and so on and so forth with a transfer length of uh, 8 bytes. You can see those values are duplicated here. And uh, the actual data that gets sent in addition to these options is uh, just a bunch of zeros and a two. Again, that comes from there, a bunch of zeros and a two. It's also here, the data fragment. Um, so I do that, I send that control transfer and once that completes, then I initiate a um, the interrupt transfer. I've configured this endpoint here to be an interrupt trans uh, transfer. And it's up here. And uh, that basically gets me back eight bytes. I grab the first one because that's uh, what actually changes when you hit the button. And there you go, I try to interpret it and I figure out if the button is pressed or not. So let's uh, try it out. Um, the way I've set this up, you pass um, a command to, uh, to this script here and the uh, script will run that command whenever you push the button. So. Uh, I wanted to uh, hit the enter key for me, so I use uh, xdo tool, which allows you to inject key presses. So I say uh, xdo tool key return. That's an unfortunate line break, but there you have it. Uh, so let's give it a try. <laughs> 